Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today I want to talk about something which is often forgotten about when we discuss how we're going to survive disaster scenarios. And I'm going to entitle this video The Silent Killer. You're going to want to stick around because this information that I'm going to provide you today could be life-saving. So let's get to it. Now, as a mental health counselor and someone who makes videos like this all the time, I've been forced to ask myself just how useful a person like myself might be in an environment where you need people who have the skill sets such as growing food or security or building things, engineers, plumbers, people who are right now probably working the skilled trade positions are going to be hot commodities. And you have to wonder where you rank on the priority list when you work in a line of work like I do. But after some deep contemplation about it, and I'm always a devil's advocate, including my own devil's advocate, I've come to the understanding that people like myself will be incredibly valuable for reasons that I'm going to get into today. It doesn't matter what skill set you have. You can be the best marine, you can be uh, the best gardener, you can be a jack-of-all-trades person who can pretty much rebuild anything. If you don't have your sanity, you have nothing. And SHTF entails loss. Shit hitting the fan means that something has been lost. And what I'm about to talk about today is not just relevant to the big SHTF. It's also relevant to your everyday life. I'm talking right down to losing 20 bucks to losing your entire city uh, while you're out of town to a nuclear attack. Grief and loss can be paralyzing, even to the most skilled amongst us, and it can make your skill set utterly useless, if not a hazard to yourself and others. The magnitude of the loss that you've incurred is going to dictate the potential magnitude of the loss of sanity you may incur if you don't have an awareness of what's going on within you. I'm pretty sure all of you can relate to what I'm talking about. When you lose something that you love, you know, it could be a pet, it could be a relationship you were in, it could be heartbreak, it could be a financial loss, it could be the loss of a job, a loss of a friend, the list goes on. So I'm pretty sure if you look back in your memory banks, you can find a situation And you can think about how that situation was somewhat debilitating for you. This is important that you can get yourself to really imagine what it is I'm talking about. Because we all imagine that we're going to be functioning at the highest level when we're up against the odds in these, you know, apocalyptic scenarios that we envision. The fact is, if you think for a second that you're going to be functioning 100%, after you've watched somebody dear to you be untimely taken away, then you are sadly mistaken and you are setting yourself up for a disaster. It's all fine and dandy to prep rice, beans, guns, ammo, band-aids, your physical health, but if you do not have an awareness of the process of grief and loss, then you are going to be at a loss. And today I'm going to share with you some critical tools and concepts that are going to be absolutely critical if you want to be able to manage grief and loss in a disaster situation. Now, we're not going to explore this from a spiritual perspective. Indeed, some of you probably have spiritual means of coping with these type of situations. And that's fine. If that helps you cope, then that's great. Some of you don't have those or some of you have those and find that that's not enough. So in order to understand what grief and loss is, it helps if you understand it as a biological process. And all that really means is that we're going to be reducing it down to the level of how it works in our brains. Because what you need to understand is that you are an organic being. All of your thoughts are the result of this neural firing that's going on right now. And... What grief and loss is, is essentially that you have 
develop these neural pathways that have been designed in a certain way uh, that mirror what you've come to know. So if you are strongly attached to something, you have a neural pathway that's really hardwired for that thing. So if you have a family pet, for instance, that family pet is hardwired into your, your synapses in so many different ways. There's so many memories in there. You know, when you come home, your brain knows that, oh, dog is going to be coming to see me. So these neural pathways mirror our experience. They mirror the real world. Now, when the real world abruptly changes, our neurons and our synaptic connections no longer accurately mirror that real world. So that forces us to adapt. There's going to be an adaptation period. All we once knew needs now to be changed. doesn't matter if I lost 20 bucks. I had a plan for that 20 bucks up here somewhere. Now I have to recalibrate. I have to get rid of whatever plan I might have had and whatever you know um, ideas I might have had for that $20. And I have to develop a new one. I have to understand that my new reality is one without 20 bucks. In the same way, I need to understand that my new reality is one without what it was I was attached to. doesn't matter if it was a person, if it was a place, if it was possessions, if it was a society that has now collapsed. I need to part ways with it. It takes time to rebuild those synaptic connections. The deeper the attachment that you've had with something, the longer it's going to take to make a new reality for yourself. And the faster you can do this, the better off you're going to be, especially when shit is moving really damn fast and there's no time to sit there and go crazy uh, when you have to be functioning at the highest level possible. It doesn't matter if the walls are crashing down or if you just have to be very alert because things are happening all around you, you know, society is collapsing, whatever. You know, maybe there's a security threats and you need to be you need to be on the ball. So you can't be in this state of paralysis, which is caused by this abrupt shift in reality that happens with grief and loss. The important thing to remember here is that everybody goes through this. It doesn't matter if you're the most hard, tactical badass there is. You're going to go through this when something you love is taken away. And if you don't, then that probably means that you do have some psychopathic tendencies or you're uh, repressing it. You're trying to block it out like they condition some people to do in the military in order to finish the mission or whatever. Uh, and that will work for a short period of time. But once you snap back to reality, you're going to be faced with what's happened. So what happens here is pretty simple. There's three main stages. There's attachment, there's loss, and then hopefully there's acceptance. Okay. This is where you want to eventually get to. Now you're attached to things. You're attached to everything right now. You might not think you are, but you're attached to it. You're attached to the screen that you're watching this on right now. That screen gets broken. You cross this line. Change has occurred. Essentially all change entails some level of loss on some level because change by definition means that something that once was is not there anymore. So you've lost something. So we're going to go through these stages of grief and loss. This is pretty common understanding, I think, for most people. So the first stage is shock. You know, it's the what just happened. Right? Just watched uh, The Walking Dead season premiere the other day. I, you know, I was kind of disappointed. I'm going to be honest. I might get some thumbs down for this, but I'm, I'm pretty disappointed that the fanboys were right about Glenn and Abraham's death. I mean, I knew that that was going to be a high possibility, but I thought AMC was a bit more creative than that. I thought it was a little bit overblown and all the Hollywood kind of culture that's built around it now with the talking dead and all that. It's starting to annoy me, but it's still one of the best shows on television. Where was I going with that? Okay, so the shock when uh, buddies get hit over the head with a baseball bat right away. The shock, you know. Wow, 
right? This can't be happening. What, what the hell is happening? The second stage is denial. And depending on the lucidity of the situation, this might be a stage you go through rather quickly. Some people will refuse to let go and refuse to believe that what's gone is gone. And they'll pray and they'll wish and they'll bargain with the man or woman upstairs, whatever you believe it is, and to try to bring that person back or bring what's back, bring back what's lost. Uh, the stages I think that really are problematic for a lot of people are anger and depression. Remember, asshole and bitch, okay? Both are on the level of dumbass right now. Not yet, because these are things you have to go through. You have to go through a little bit of anger, a little bit of depression. You're going to have those thoughts. You're going to have those emotions. But if you understand the reason why you're having those emotions, you're angry because something, a reality you once knew, is not anymore. And then when you realize, and you're angry because you're resisting, you know, you, you, you don't want to go into this new world, into this, this is the unknown, this is the known. If you think about life, we're going through life like this constantly. Unknown, known. It's living is dying, right? We're in a constant state of change. We're in a constant state of going through this grief and loss every day. There's a word called entropy, which is a word that denotes the inevitable breakdown of things or society. It's used um, in some ways to describe you know, the, the fact that all civilizations collapse and that this civilization we live in will inevitably collapse. When is a question. But just like that, our bodies are in a constant state of collapse. Everything is in a constant state of breakdown. So loss is inevitable. So you don't want to get stuck in these areas. You don't want to get stuck in anger, stuck in depression. Because, of course, uh, if you don't process it fast enough, you're putting yourself and others at risk. So there comes a point then, it, inevitably you end up here. Because you're going to fight and resist and, you know, want revenge and all this stuff. But eventually you're going to get tired and you're going to be depressed. There's going to be a sense of helplessness when you realize you can't get this back. You cannot recreate what once was again. It's impossible. So you have a choice. You can either continue to resist or you can cross over into acceptance. And because of the neural familiarity thing, you're going to get here. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time before all of those uh, things that you associated with that person or that place or whatever it is you lost fade into me distant memory and to, to the point where they're no longer strong associations. Like to give you an example, when I quit smoking cigarettes, an addiction is much like this. As an addiction, when you quit an addiction, it's, it's a strong, strong grief and loss. Uh, but when I was a smoker, I always would associate coffee with cigarettes. So every time I had a cup of coffee, I would imagine myself having a cigarette and it was just, it was like torture. So I had to quit coffee. You may have to quit doing things that remind you of that person, or you may have to quit doing things that uh, conjure up those old memories and emotions that you don't want to experience because they're too overwhelming. And eventually I was able to drink coffee again. Literally those synaptic connections that I had that linked coffee and cigarette eventually just die off and you no longer make the association anymore. One doesn't trigger the other. So, you know, uh, waking up in the morning with the person you love next to you, that's going to be hard for months and months and months. But eventually it's not going to be hard because the neural uh, connection is not there anymore. It's died. It hasn't been reinforced. So it dies. What is not reinforced dies. What fires together, wires together is a saying in neuropsychology. So if you resist, what happens? You want revenge. You go into a rage. You become apathetic. 
You don't care about anything. You turn to addiction. You start drinking booze, like Bob, Walking Dead, despair, right? Maybe you start chasing ghosts, like Rick. And at the bottom, deepest, darkest point of this crevasse is suicide, taking your own life, because you simply cannot conceive of yourself existing in a reality that does not entail what you are used to being familiar with. Why people go here is because they don't understand this process. They feel that this is going to be forever. They feel that this is just going down, down, down. And perhaps I shouldn't have drawn it like this. Perhaps I should have drawn it the other way. So I'd like you to do a little mental exercise right now. Reverse this because really you should start on the bottom and you should start with shock, denial, bargaining, anger, depression. And then that should be your considered your highest point because you should know at that point that you're almost at a point of crossing over into acceptance. The sooner you can accept that your reality is going to be the way it is, the better off you're going to be. The sooner you can accept the shitty situation that you don't want, the better off you're going to be. I mean, you can sit there and wish upon a star as long as you want. You're never, ever going to bring it back. And that's why a lot of people are debilitated when these things happen. Simply because they cannot just make a choice. They cannot just accept that, okay, it's gone. Things are different now. I need to be okay with this. It's simply a matter of choosing to do that. So before you can have grief and loss, you need attachment. You need to have familiarity to something in order for it to seem like a loss. Knowing that it's a natural process that you have to go through, that your body is engineered to go through, can be an empowering thing. And really the biggest cure for overcoming grief and loss is to have an awareness of what's going on when you're stricken with the paralysis of grief. I'm a firm believer that there is no grief and loss that has to be in vain. So depending on how you move into acceptance and how you detach yourself from whatever was lost, that can determine how much you can get out of that experience. I always feel that uh, it's through grief and loss that we gain a wisdom about life and it can be very empowering. And the fact that you are still alive is empowering. Uh, maybe your family was taken from you, you know, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the point of living? Well, maybe the point of living is to help somebody else's family. Maybe the point of living is to start a new family. You know, it's hard for us to accept that when we're in this state. But if you can get here, if you can adapt new behavioral pattern, a new, more enlightened perspective, growth. And the fact is, death is just a part of life. Everybody's going to die. All of us. I personally have always found bereavement to be somewhat silly. Uh, I find it funny how we always celebrate births and cry at funerals when essentially life is suffering. I don't mean that in a fatalistic, suicide endorsing sense of the word. Especially people who are religious, when people have finally served their time here and are now free, and now free to rest. You know, uh, there's a freedom in death. You know, there's a freedom in not being attached there's a freedom in being detached from things that we never see because we're so used to that thing defining us, being a part of us. There's always a silver lining to everything. And all hope is not lost until you're dead. And then 
you can rest. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out. Check out the Canadian Preppers Network blog, an excellent resource for survivalists and preppers.